We're thrilled to have with us here at the 2011 ASCO conference from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. We have with us Dr. Jeffrey Shapiro. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me. All right, so we're going to talk about Ganetaspib, or what's easier for me is STA-9090. <laughs> either one, it's fine. All right, but either way, whichever name we use, you've got some exciting work going on with it. Yes, we just completed a fairly large phase two study of the drug in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer, and we've demonstrated activity and uh, some prolonged stable disease and some real clinical benefit for patients. What were the objectives of this phase two study with ganetaspib? The objectives of the study uh, were to look at the anti-tumor activity of STA-9090 or ganetaspib in the advanced lung cancer population. Um, ag anti-tumor activity was defined as having being progression free or stable or responding for at least 16 weeks, so approximately four months, with for, which for patients with advanced lung cancer is a mark of uh, success. Um, the study looked at three groups of uh, lung cancer patients. Those whose tumors had an EGFR mutation, uh, patients whose tumor had a KRAS mutation, and patients whose tumors were wild type or normal for both EGFR and KRAS. And there was some interesting activity in each of those arms. How was the drug administered to patients in the study? So ganetespib or STA9090 is given intravenously uh, and it's given once a week, uh, three weeks of every four. Would you explain the different cohorts used in the study? Yeah, so as I was saying, so one cohort was for patients whose tumors ha um, have an EGFR mutation. So those are patients whose tumors are very dependent on an altered EGFR to generate the signaling pathway and drive this tumor growth. And it's previously been shown that Patient, that e mutant or abnormal EGFR is very dependent on HSP90 for its stability. So testing an HSP90 inhibitor in that group made a lot of sense. The second group was a group of patients whose tumors had a KRAS mutation. And KRAS signals through some very complex pathways, but multiple components of those pathways are dependent on HSP90. So again, in that group of tumors, um, it also makes sense to test an HSP90 inhibitor. The third group of patients were tumors, were patients whose tumors had a normal EGFR and a normal KRAS. And those are patients whose tumors are dependent on other transforming proteins. And many of them are also dependent on HSP90 for their stability. So in that group that was normal for EGFR and normal for wild type, it also made sense to test the drug there. So they we're trying to more molecularly dissect the different groups of lung cancer, and we wanted to assess the activity of this drug in each of those groups separately. What toxicities did you observe? Uh, Ganetespib is actually very well tolerated. The main toxicity of this drug is diarrhea. So it's usually mild or, in some patients, moderate severity, but it's very easily manageable with appropriate supportive medications. Otherwise, there were some patients who had fatigue, a loss of appetite, but again, overall, these, um, these side effects were um, of usually of mild severity and were very easily manageable. And um, very few patients left the trial for side effects related to ganetespib. Uh, patients usually came off the trial if their disease was worsening, but it wasn't because of a drug toxicity. The other important thing to point out about this particular HSP90 inhibitor is it can be distinguished from others in the class. So other HSP90 inhibitors have been complicated by elevated liver function tests, and that did not occur to any great degree on ganetespib. And then a number of the newer HSP90 inhibitors have had a disturbing uh, toxicity of visual disturbances. And again, that did not occur in this trial. So, the absence of liver function problems and of ocular or visual disturbances distinguished ganetespib from other ones in this class. Dr. Shapiro, can you summarize the clinical activity observed in patients with ALK positive tumors and the KRAS mutation and discuss durable partial response and prolonged stable disease? Right, so as I mentioned, there were three arms, the EGFR mutant arm, the KRAS mutant arm, and then the arm where the EGFR and KRAS were normal. So in the KRAS mutant arm, this is a group of patients that are usually very recalcitrant to treatment. They usually don't respond to treatment. This is often associated with a poor prognosis. And in this group, 
we definitely had several patients who had um, regression. It wasn't enough um, regression of tumor to be defined as a partial response, but nonetheless, we did see some shrinkage. And out of 14 evaluable patients in that group, uh, one patient did stay on longer than 16 weeks, so did stay on for more than four months, which is a good start and uh, does suggest that it's a building block for further work in that group. Um, the more dramatic results, though, were the most dramatic results in the trial were in the group that was normal for, for EGFR and normal for uh, RAS. And um, so this was the third group of patients. And in that group, there is a subset whose tumors are dependent on a protein called EML4-ALK. So this is uh, the result of a translocation, a genetic translocation that occurs in the cancer that forms a new oncoprotein or a new oncogene and oncoprotein that drives the growth of the cancer cell. And the name of that oncoprotein is EML4-ALK. And we had shown preclinically that EML4-ALK is very dependent on HSP90 for its stability. And in this particular study, in this group that had normal EGFR, normal KRAS, but they had an abnormal ALK, there were eight patients. And of the eight patients, seven of them stayed on the trial for more than 16 weeks, so that's considered prolonged stability. And four of them actually had a partial response, so had more than 30% shrinkage. And a good number of these patients have actually now been on anywhere between seven months and 14 months, with some of those patients still ongoing. So this was quite successful in this group of patients. More than a building block. Yeah, so I think so. Based on the results of the study and assuming future studies will support your findings, what do you think Ganatespib could offer non-small cell lung cancer patients as a potential therapeutic option? Well, the one thing about all these subsets is there are other classes of drugs available. And so, for example, for the EML4 ALK population, there is a small molecule a pill that's available called crizotinib, and that is being actively developed in that subset. What we need to do with ganatespib is uh, look to see whether or not uh, this drug will work when patients become resistant to crizotinib. And if we're successful there, and we can demonstrate some activity in patients who are resistant to crizotinib, we now have a second-line treatment for those patients, and that can be offered to them in the future. Uh, the other um, piece of um, future work that our, our trial um, portends is the combination of crizotinib with the HSP90 inhibitor. So you can imagine a clinical trial in which the HSP90 inhibitor is combined with, with ganatespib is combined with crizotinib. And I think that might actually produce some very exciting results for those patients. We might be better than either drug alone by combining them. Dr. Shapiro, thanks for sharing your work with us. We appreciate it. No, thanks very much for having me. Keep up the pleasure. good work at Dana-Farber. All right, I appreciate that. All right. Take care.